there is no way that Peter, James, and John could ever have expected what was about to happen to them. There was no precedent in the ministry of Jesus that would lead them to believe that they would be taken away by Jesus, not merely for a time of prayer, but actually for a time of revelation, when God would re reveal something, meaning who His Son, in fact, actually is. Um, it's, it's a stunning gospel in that way. You see, all along they had seen Jesus teach like no one had ever taught, do miracles that no one had done, act in ways that were extraordinarily above and beyond just another traveling rabbi. And yet, it wasn't until just before this event that Jesus finally turns to his disciples and say, in the midst of everything that's going on, what do people say? Who do they say that I am? And of course, they repeat back to him the word on the street. Well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're a prophet. Um, and Jesus turns to them in that way that only Jesus can and make it very, very personal and say, but who do you say I am? Ooh, we're not just having chatter anymore, are we? You're asking something extraordinarily. I, I can just feel when Jesus says that to them, the disciples going, oh, what do we say now? <laughs> <laughs> and Peter, of course, true to his impetuous nature and his courage, quite frankly, says, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus does not say, oh, now that's carrying it a bit too far. <laughs> Instead, he says, it's God that's revealed this to you. Or to quote him, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. You just didn't get this by observation. In other words, God is the one who has revealed this to you. And that's the reference at the very beginning of the Gospel reading, where it says, six days after Peter had acknowledged Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high, to a high mountain by themselves. The location, as far as we can understand, is Mount Tabor, which in fact, if you go to Israel, has on it a church, Shrine of the Transfiguration, and it is a vista. You can overlook a valley. And it's quite, it's actually quite moving to be there. But the point of this story was not, as we'll, we will find out later, to create a monument. Instead, the point was to reveal and to confirm something to Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and John, about his very nature. This is not an event you see for Jesus, as much as it is an event for his disciples, and by extension for us, to see and confirm our own wonder about who, in fact, Jesus is. Because as soon as they begin to gather and to pray, something extraordinary begins to happen. As the scripture says, he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became dazzling white. Now, they have, in their own sort of schooling about Judaism, they only have one precedent for this, and that's Moses. And we read, in fact, the preface in the Old Testament lesson, because you see, what happens is that when Moses goes up into that cloud, which is where the lesson le left us, he comes back down 40 days later. And what is he? He is radiant. In fact, the scripture records that the light on his face was so bright, people couldn't actually look at him directly. You see, theophany, which is the word, happens in the scripture when something extraordinarily important is taking place. It's God's exclamation point, calling to people's attention what it is that is happening. And so Moses receives, you see, the Ten Commandments, the whole basis for Jewish law, the, much of the basis of our own law, as a matter of fact, in terms of ancient jurisprudence. It's, an, it's a monumental event you see in human history. And so Moses coming down, carrying the tablets, is a glow. So here, having Peter having already confessed, act 
accurately who Jesus, in fact, is. And it's complete. Who are you? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The whole thing, you see. God in the flesh. God confirms that with an exclamation point. Only this time, it's a teaching moment to show who Jesus is. The contrast is important as well as, well as the parallel. The parallel is Moses, but the contrast is the fact that while Moses had that light shining upon him, reflected, as it were, glory, Jesus, on the other hand, and it shows by the fact that his, even his clothes are alight, there's something that radiates out of him. It's not reflected glory, it is imminent glory. It is the pulling back, as one commentator said, of the dullness of earthly conditions stripped away so that the true nature of this is my beloved son can in fact be seen briefly by the human eye. There is no mistake. This is something bigger happening. This is someone bigger not just a mere mortal. Peter, impetuous Peter, speaks out again. He doesn't know what to say. In fact, one of the gospel readings says, he had no idea what he was saying when he was saying this stuff. <laughs> when, he, when he says, well, I know what we should do. We should actually create, and here it's translated dwelling places. It's almost like booths. One for Moses, one for you, one for Elijah. Um, is it could be like, I don't want to leave, this is more amazing than anything I've ever known. Or it could be, in fact, the erecting of a kind of shrine for each one of them, you see. But that's not, co-equality between Jesus, Moses, and Elijah is not the point of this event. The point is the uniqueness of Jesus. And so what happens? The exclamation point gets a little hotter where the cloud comes rolling in, hiding everything. And at this point, where, where are the disciples? They're on their faces. They, at this point, are absolutely terrified. Because, you see, no one can come into the presence of God and live. That's how they understood things. In fact, even in the Old Testament story of Moses coming down full of light, Thunder and lightning is happening. It was such a terrifying sight to quote the book of Mo book of Hebrews that no one actually even wanted to touch the mountain on which it was happening, lest they would be killed. It was a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of God. What does God say? He says, no, 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 it's not co-equality here. He says, this is my son. It's a repetition of what was said in his baptism. The beloved, with him I am well pleased. And then, with a little add-on, listen to him. In other words, this isn't like we're a part of a religious lineage here and all of us are equal and all these paths are the same. No, no, no. This is something unique. God revealing his son in a way that sets him apart from the ministry of law and prophets as we rightly sang in graduate. This is something new. And how do we see that? And this is the part of the story that actually I really, really love. Is that after the cloud begins to recede, Jesus comes over. Remember, glory manifested still. And what does he do? He doesn't stand apart, just sort of like, like this. Have you ever seen the transfiguration portrayed in movies? There is one, I can't remember which one, where Jesus is just sort of like, he's sort of like a medieval stained glass window. <laughs> That's not in here. No, 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 it's much more tender than that. He actually walks over to where they are and puts his hand on them. He, he touches them. You see, in Jesus, there need not be any fear of manifest glory. In Jesus, there is, in fact, unity between glory and humanity. Flesh and spirit are joined together in Jesus, making him, as the word made flesh, God made manifest, as we say, approachable for the first time for, human, for the human race. What does he 
say to them? Oh, he says, get up, don't be afraid. It's like, come on, let's go. It's okay. For me, that's actually the heartbeat of the story. Not just the revelation of who he is as God made in flesh manifest, but also who he is as God made flesh manifest, laying his hand on those brothers that he loved so dearly and calling them to continue to walk with him. Both are important. Why? Because there are those of us who imagine God and we get the glory part, high and lifted up above all else, quite unapproachable. And, and therefore, there is a part of us in the light of that that whenever we want to be in the presence of God, it's almost like we want to duck a little. Like, gosh, if I get too close, what's going to happen to me? But Jesus takes us beyond that. That glory manifest in Him is approachable. Even, even touchable. And it's not just human touch, you see. It is also glory manifested. He's not just another sort of extra bright rabbi with some miracle power. He really is God made flesh, unique in all of humanity. There has never been anyone like him, either before or since. This is my son, the voice says. Listen to him. You see, the whole story is important. It's not just the glory of transfiguration. It is glory of transfiguration approachable. That we in fact can come to him. And in fact he does come to us. Calling us to in fact be close. Don't be afraid. But you see, it's important for us to hear that because there is that fear inside of us, is there not? That if Jesus is in fact who he says he is, manifest glory, my goodness, that if, if I get close to that, what's, what's going to happen to me? I mean, the fear in my life might be, what if I get exposed? What if the things that I'm trying to hide in my life actually get manifested? I don't want to get too close to God. What's going to, is, are the parts of my heart that I wish weren't there in fact going to be illuminated? Is light going to shine on them? I want to keep some of that stuff in the dark. <laughs> I wish it wasn't there. The last thing I want. And every time I think about that, there's a part of me that can get real religious, you see. <laughs> So I, I know how to do all the hand motions. But it's really a cover. I don't know that I want God to get that close. Which is why the second part of the story is so extraordinarily important. It's manifested in his invitation that you hear him say in this gospel, come to me who? Not the religious. All you who are weary, who are heavy laden, I'll refresh. I'll bring you rest. In other words, when the glory of God comes in to touch the depths of our heart and our humanity, exactly what happened to the disciples is not what happens to us. We don't fall on our faces in stark terror. Instead, what happens is that we have the experience of being received. What is imparted to us is forgiveness and mercy and profound love, more love than we could have ever, ever known. And so that what happens in our life is that Jesus becomes not the one who's just out there on the cloud, but actually there is a presence inside of us that does not let us go. That for which we just count on day in and day out, no matter who we are, no matter what we go through. It is that central importance of God, imminent, God's imminence in Jesus drawing us to himself that is at the heartbeat of what it in fact it means to be Christian. In the end, it's not so much precepts and laws or even creedal confessions. All of those are important, but all of those are the, 
the scaffolding. What really is the building underneath the scaffolding is humanity and divinity joined together, not just in Jesus, but in us. God coming and making a home <coughs> within us, claiming us, calling us his sons and daughters, bringing us healing and life and just the wonder of his presence, the joy of what it means to know that I'm forgiven, that I have a purpose in life, that there's a reason for my being, that life can become in him a kind of adventure that never ever is in the same way possible if I'm just out there trying to chart the course on my own and yeah, when I get into trouble, I ask God to help me because at that point I know I'm over my head. No, there's a new, a new kind of companionship. So that Jesus becomes the supreme relationship. And who he is, is of supreme importance to me in my life. C.S. Lewis put it this way in mere Christianity. Christianity, if false, is of no importance. Actually, I would add that if it's false, it's actually dangerous. Because it's delusion. But if it's true, it is of infinite importance. The only thing that Christianity cannot be is moderately important. Yeah, I, I believe that. No, 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 no. There's more to this than that. This is glory manifested, reaching out and touching us. We who are afraid of being discovered. And Jesus saying to us, oh, no, no, come with me. Don't be afraid. And us in the companionship of his presence, knowing a new kind of power, a new kind of light, a new kind of joy in our lives that we could have never, ever known apart from the other. That's really the message of this Transfiguration Sunday. G divinity manifested and in love touching humanity and claiming it at his own. We're about to go into Lent. Ash Wednesday is this coming Wednesday. And you see, Lent is meant to invite us more deeply into this relationship. Which is why this gospel is so extraordinarily important. Because quite honestly, what happens to a lot of people when they try to get into Lent is because they have this hands-off sort of fearful relationship, like I don't want him to get too close to me. Then all of the Lent disciplines wind up coming across as just legalism. You know, what did you give up? Well, I gave up chocolate. <laughs> Rather than seeing Lent as an opportunity to draw close to you. And organizing the disciplines in a way that would actually invite that to begin to happen in our lives. So today is the day to deal with the fear. That, I don't know that I want you too close, God. And instead, hear the word of Jesus to his disciples in this story. Oh, do not be afraid. Come on, let's go together. And to know that in him, there is, even in the deepest part of our hearts, the possibility for mercy, for wholeness, for healing, for the freedom from fear and condemnation. If you hear that today, then you'll be ready for this Ash Wednesday, because you'll look forward to the adventure of what it means to draw closer to God, and to know more and more of that kind of vitality, that kind of vibrance, that kind of wondrous peace and power. So what I would like us to do is pray, and pray that God would in fact draw us close, and if there are those walls inside of us, those places of inhibition, those borders where we would wish God not to cross. And he by his power would answer the deeper cry in us and draw us to himself, break down the barriers, and bring in our lives new joy, which is in fact meant to be the fruit of that. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we do confess to you that there are parts of our life that we like to keep hidden. We confess to you that sometimes we really do prefer self-reliance. And we
we ask, O oh Lord, that you would overcome in us that which we cannot overcome in ourselves. That you would come and begin to gently, but with great determination, remove the barriers. Answer the deeper cry that is within us. The cry for wholeness, for meaning, for purpose, for forgiveness. And draw us to yourself even when we resist, that we too might know that peace which passes all understanding, the rest and the joy that you promise. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray.